After the story took an unexpected turn, Narumi, being the commander of the first unit, took the responsibility and decided to train Kikaru, and asked Kafka to lend him his power to defeat the monster who slain their beloved chief. On the other hand, it was revealed that Kaiju No. 10 is still alive and had an interesting encounter with Hashina. In this video, expect to see exciting team-ups, big revelations, and much more action-packed battles. Let's get started. Let's go back to a point in time when Okanaji had just told Hashina that Monster No. 10, which they had placed in confinement, had awakened. At that time, Hashina was training, and Okanaji quickly arrived to share the news. While Hashina was explaining that they should try to gather information about Number 9 and other monsters, Okanaji suddenly mentioned that Number 10 said it would not talk to anyone else and would only communicate with Hashina. Hashina, puzzled by this, decided to go to the incubator where Number 10 was. While examining the readings of this monster, the scientists were incredulous that Number 10 could still reach a resilience of 5.7 given its current physical state. It turns out Mina was also there, and a scientist asked her if it was correct that the monster would not regenerate, to which Mina responded not to worry because it was impossible for a core in such a state to do so. Soon after, Hashina arrived and had the door opened. He seriously greeted the monster with a good morning, even calling it Sleeping Beauty, and asked if Number 10 had a good sleep. Hashina and Number 10 stared at each other, and suddenly, Number 10 roared loudly, causing significant sound waves. The scientists were terrified and amazed because their vice commander could match a monster of such strength. Hashina commented on how noisy Number 10 was, calling it a dumbass. He warned that if 10 did that again, he would chop it up, which made Number 10 laugh. It said that Hashina was really different from the others, and it would surely be fun if it had managed to eat him whole. Okanaji reminded Hashina to be careful because they could not predict the behavior of that monster. Hashina stared at Number 10, got straight to the point, and mentioned that there was a monster they called Number 9. He showed an image of it to Number 10 and asked if it knew anything about that monster. 10 and Mina stared, and Number 10 quickly agreed, saying it didn't mind about that because, after all, it was created by Number 9. The people in the room were shocked and wondered what 10 meant by that. 10 added that before it spoke, it had one condition. It wanted them to release it from the incubator and for Hashina to fight it. Hashina and Mina stared, and Hashina explained that he couldn't do that, but regardless, with the core that Number 10 had, it surely no longer had the ability to regenerate to the point where it could fight again. Number 10 disagreed and explained that it was well aware of that, and that wasn't what it was suggesting. It knows they have human technology to weaponize their kaiju bodies, so it desires to become a weapon and be worn by Hashina. Number 10 wants Hashina to surrender his body to this monster. Mina was shocked to encounter a monster that wished to be weaponized, and Okanaji quickly tried to convince Hashina that it was too dangerous because weaponizing a conscious monster was unprecedented, and they didn't know what kind of impact it would have on the user. The monster added that it enjoyed fighting Hashina and that it felt like a dream. Hashina told Number 10 to be quiet, asserting that it wasn't enjoyable, to which Number 10 countered by calling that a very boring lie. As a being that had fought Hashina firsthand, it knew better. It was obvious that it also enjoyed their fight. Number 10 remarked that Hashina was similar to itself, so he should understand that as long as Number 10 gets exciting battles, it doesn't matter whether its opponent is a human or a monster. Mina and Okanaji were startled by this, and Hashina then told Number 10 that he needed to step out for a moment and asked for some time. After he stepped out, Hashina was left speechless and wondered what was with Number 10 and how terrifying it was. Okanaji was also taken aback by Hashina's reaction and added how much of a battle maniac the monster was and how pushy it was which also scared him for his physical safety in a different way. Hashina did not want to witness such a thing. Okanaji shouted, agreeing that he was also against it, and besides having no precedent, they knew nothing about the monster's plans, and there was also the danger that Number 10 might take over Hashina's body. Hashina pondered and said that they really had no other source of information, and he mentioned the phrase, needs must when the devil drives, meaning sometimes you must do things you don't want to do. 
Hashin aside and called Mina, stating that he wanted to accept Number Tin's demand. Mina also agreed and decided to take a risk on Hashina's decision, and she would appeal to headquarters to have Number Tin weaponized. As Hashina stared at Number Tin, he couldn't explain why there was a strange thing that liked him. Eventually, their conversation led to a deal, and Hashina added that, nevertheless, he had one thing to say. It wouldn't be Monster Number Tin using him, but he would be the one using Number Tin. They looked at each other, and Number Tin grinned. In the next scene, several scientists were talking in an elevator about the imminent arrival of members from the third unit at their location. One of them asked if Commander Mina was being referred to, whereupon a scientist with highlighted hair clarified that he was actually referring to Vice Commander Hashina, prompting another to comment seriously since it had been three years since he last visited there. The scientist with highlighted hair mentioned that he had heard they had new information about the catastrophe caused by Number 9 which led the one with plain black hair to assert that surely Number 10 was the source of their information. A female scientist then said that if the representative from the third unit was Hashina, things might get somewhat unpleasant. We then switched to a scene where the first unit had just finished their morning drill. Eiji informed the exhausted Kikaru and Kafka that Hashina was coming for a meeting about countermeasures against Number 9. Kafka then reflected that he had yet to apologize to their vice commander for hiding his identity. Eiji asked where Narumi was, to which Kikaru responded that he had left with some troops, eliciting a comment from Eiji that this was bad. Kafka wondered why that was bad, so Eiji explained that since both the first and third units had territories in Tokyo, they were often compared to each other, and not just that. The two units often escalated conflicts due to territorial issues and more. In other words, they were like oil and water. It turns out that the first and third units indeed met at a location, and Narumi was extremely irritated with Hashina for stepping into his territory without permission. Hashina calmly responded that Narumi's welcome was quite grand for personally greeting him, explaining that he had obtained permission from the higher-ups at the main branch, so Narumi should just ignore them. Narumi still did not agree, and declared the area off-limits to people with bowl cuts or fox eyes, both of which Hashina had. Hashina commented could it be that Narumi still harbored resentment, and was Narumi still angry that he had been beaten by him in the subjugation exercise ranking for the small monster category. It was like a sharp knife had stabbed Narumi when he heard that he had been defeated by Hashina, causing him to kneel down, which worried some of his troop members about him and some were angry at the third unit for what they had done to their commander, where the third unit members said they hadn't done anything. A member of the first unit finally lost his patience and said they still hadn't moved on from the case in Tsujinami last month, and the third units had no right to subjugate the monsters under their jurisdiction. The third unit members countered that some after beasts were in the Mataka area, so they just subjugated the base monster as an extension of that. In that case, the first unit members argued that they should still be asking for permission, which further irritated the third unit members who said it was unbelievable because they always wanted them to ask for permission. Narumi shouted for his unit to continue fighting, and the only record Hashina had broken was for small monsters, and aside from that, he held all the other titles. Hashina then questioned that wasn't it Mina who held the title in the sniper category, which seemed to be another sharp object that stabbed Narumi. Narumi's troop members grew even more worried about him and questioned why he would state such an obvious lie. Narumi shouted again for them to be quiet and said he didn't like Hashina, so he should just leave. Eiji then arrived, quickly hit Narumi on the head, and told him to stop. The other first unit troop members immediately saluted and composed themselves. Eiji greeted Hashina, noting it had been a long time since they had met, and Hashina did the same. Eiji mentioned that the preparations for the division meeting were complete, and he would accompany Hashina there. Upon their arrival at the meeting office, we saw many defense force members there, and once everyone was assembled, Itami commented that they would start the Eastern Division meeting to strategize their plan to combat Kaiju No. 9. Present were the commander of the first unit, Narumi, the vice commander of the first unit, Eiji, the commander of the second unit, Jura Igarashi, the commander of the third unit, Mina, the vice commander of the third unit, Hashina, and the commander of the fourth unit, Jugo Ogata. 
Jura was irritated with Narumi for being too lax, to which Narumi countered that it was his decision to relax if he wanted to. Mina commented that Jura should ignore it, as there was nothing new there. Narumi, she said, was the type of man with no redeeming features aside from beating monsters, which Narumi overheard and was irritated by, feeling that Mina's words hurt more than Jura's. Jugo calmed everyone down, noting they hadn't seen each other for a long time, so they should try to get along. Jura was also irritated with him for drinking alcohol there. Soon, Itami shouted for them to quiet down, and he thought irritably about Isao, who had died and left him with all these troublesome staff members. It turns out that Itami was the new chief of the defense force after Isao's disappearance, and he immediately asked Hashina what they were there to discuss. Hashina promptly stood up and began to explain that the third unit had obtained some new information about Number 9, and as it turns out, the catastrophes caused by Number 9 were not something that the first unit could handle alone. Narumi then asked where they had gotten this information. So Hashina said it came from Monster Number 10, who was currently in confinement and had said something quite surprising. He revealed that he was created by Number 9. This captured the attention of everyone in the room, and Jura commented, asking if Hashina was saying that Number 9 created a monster with a resilience of 9.0. Hashina agreed and explained that Number 9 was the first variant with intention, and it likely had the ability to create other powerful monsters. Monster Number 10 added that it was a prototype, and it wanted to combat the polished products that had originated from it. Jura was shocked to learn that the monster with 9.0 resilience was just a prototype. Hashina added that currently, the Japanese Defense Force's capability to handle eminent class monsters at one time is 5 at most. That number is even lower if it includes monsters exceeding a resilience of 9.5. If in the case that number 9 is creating stronger monsters that can easily surpass those numbers, what do the commanders think would happen? If they cannot overcome the rift between the units and collaborate, their country would surely perish. In the next scene, number 9, still using Esau's body, was shown sitting on a throne surrounded by pods of the monsters it was creating. The other commanders stared at Hashina, and Jugo commented that it seemed hard to believe and wondered if there was a chance that Number 10 was lying. Hashina admitted it was possible, but when he showed them data, he explained that there had been a sudden increase in the number of monster cases and variants in recent years. He stated that the average resilience had increased from 2.6 to 4.8, so they could say that this coincided with the information provided by Number 10. They also knew that there were many uncertainties surrounding the mechanism of monster outbreaks. According to recent research, the most promising theory about monster outbreaks is that an enormous energy and distortion caused by faults on Earth affect nearby plants and animals. Hashina believed that Number 9 was using this phenomenon to create monsters. AG asked if he had any information on the location of Number 9, to which Hashina replied that it moved around and changed appearance so they did not know its current location. However, if they were to look for a source of energy large enough to create several eminent class mega monsters, there was a high chance it was located where the Philippine Sea Plate meets the Eurasian Plate, a region inaccessible to mankind. Jugo thought about this and remarked that it was so vast it could take years to pinpoint the location of Number 9. Jura then shouted, asking if they were supposed to wait for it to act before they did anything. Mina added that, according to Number 10, Number 9 also gains access to the memories of the humans it absorbs, which means there is a chance that the monster now possesses knowledge of the Defense Force's strength because it consumed Isao. Following this, Hashina commented that this meant that within a few months until Number 9 acted again, their fate depended on their ability to create several unpredictable factors. Jura asked what he meant. So he explained that they have units that are not yet part of their main arsenal, which means that Number 9 hasn't yet taken them into account in his calculations. He referred to them as inexperienced and imperfect, but because of this, they have the greatest potential to grow stronger in a short period of time. The growth of their young talents, such as Reno, Haruchi, Iharu, Aoi, and other newbies, is their key to that battle. Mina then spoke, emphasizing that above all, the most important thing is the weapon made from number 6. It was set aside even though it is the strongest weapon, 
so training a troop member compatible with that weapon is crucial. The commanders there knew that the imminent monster weapon, number six, is the strongest and most dangerous weapon of all. Itami realized that Mina was planning to use the former king of monsters against the new king. Jura shouted, asking if they were saying they had found a troop member compatible with that extraordinary weapon. Hashina shifted his presentation and explained that the cell sample from that particular recruit showed signs of synchronization with number six. He was not a graduate of Subjugation University, and his defense force entrance exam scores were only average, so it was certain that he was not marked by other units. As he explained who it was, we moved to Matsumoto City, in Nagano Prefecture, where some troop members were fighting a kaiju. Ihara was there, and suddenly Reno told him to duck, and as he did, powerful attacks came towards the monster. Reno then jumped, and upon landing, Iharu was amazed at how he defeated the monster. And it turned out that Reno was the one Hashina referred to as having compatibility with the strongest imminent monster weapon. He is one of their young talents undergoing rapid growth. In the next scene, we return to a point in time where the worst memory of the defense force is depicted. Hikari arrived at an outpost and asked a troop member about the situation there, and he thanked her for her efforts. The troop member explained that the artillery unit continued their attack and had managed to take down three after beasts, but they had yet to see any effect on the base monster. Hikari carefully observed the monster and praised them for the good job they had done, identifying it as monster number six. While watching from a distance, Hikari commented that the monster seemed to be acting like a king of monsters. After this, we suddenly return to the present where Jugo is contemplating Reno as a candidate for using the suit of monster number six. He mentioned to Toko that they have a super troublesome kid, to which Toko expressed irritation because Jugo was drinking while on duty. Jugo asked if he could just be ignored because he felt that the sudden responsibility given to him would crush him and Toko commented that a person feeling the weight of their responsibility wouldn't be plucking nose hairs. Jugo reacted by saying that it really leaves a heavy thought on his mind. It wasn't just the 9.6 resilience of monster number 6, it had also led an attack involving multiple monsters with base level strength. The second unit, led by Hikari Shinomiya at that time, had fought that monster in Odawara, and with reinforcements from the first units, they had managed to subjugate it, but it came at a great sacrifice. Just like the rare heavy snowfall in Odawara is still etched in people's memories, symbolizing the despair of that time, and the higher-ups were saying they wanted to give it to a teenager to use. Toko then took away the alcohol he was about to drink, making him comment that it seemed his speech hadn't worked to go unnoticed, which Toku agreed with. Another subordinate of Jugo arrived and informed him that Reno was ready, making him look in that direction. In the next scene, in a testing room, Iharu nervously stared at Reno while wires were attached to the gauntlets he was wearing. The control room informed Reno that they were about to start his compatibility test for weapon number six. We then moved to a point in time where Jugo was talking to him, and he couldn't believe that they were going to let him use weapon number six. Jugo asked if he was aware of the numbers, or the imminent monster weapons, to which he explained that he hadn't seen them but had heard about them. If so, Reno should listen to Jugo, who explained that the number's weapons were so powerful that if handled correctly, they would allow the wielder to single-handedly take down a mega monster. On the other hand, the immense burden and increased dispatch to the front lines have caused half of the users to lose their lives before they are discharged. Of all these, weapon number six is known to be the strongest and most dangerous. He knew that as a defense force member protecting their country, it was inadvisable to say what he was about to say, but he truly thought that Reno should turn that dangerous request. After this, we return to the present as Reno recalls this, and he thinks to himself that he had heard Kafka was accepted into the defense force as monster number eight, but he also wondered what would happen to Kafka's dream, and who's going to save him. Soon after, Reno called Jugo from the control room and asked him to start the procedure. Jugo noticed the look in Reno's eyes and liked the determination he showed, and promptly began to activate the imminent monster weapon. Weapon 6, and it appeared there were no issues with assimilation or nerve tuning. Even though only the arm gear was fitted on Reno, he could feel his energy being drained. 
He steeled himself and pushed through, thinking that he would not be defeated. Jugo called for Toko and prepared a stretcher. Before long, Reno felt the immense power and pressure of monster number six, and his face showed shock and fear as he wondered what kind of monster it was. His body gave out, and that's when he realized that this was what Kafka was battling against internally. When he opened his eyes, he saw Ihara's silhouette calling to him, and was relieved when he woke up. He was in the medical office, so Reno thought he had failed to become compatible with number six. Suddenly, Jugo spoke from the side and asked him if he had realized how terrifying it was to use an imminent monster weapon. He further explained that it wasn't the full set yet, but it still put that much strain on Reno. He pointed out what he thinks will happen if Reno puts on the full gear. Jugo repeated his advice for Reno to reject it, and just as Ahara was about to agree, Reno seriously stated that he would still do it. The two looked at each other, and Jugo thought that Reno was unlikely to change his mind. He thought to himself that it was too dangerous because if Reno went to the front lines with such a number six, he would most likely lose his life in the near future. However, he knew that Reno was not the type to listen to him. He suddenly told Reno that he would give him a one-month evaluation period, and after that, he would send him on a subjugation. On Jugo's battlefield, it would be determined whether Reno was fit to wear number six. In the next scene, Ahara noticed that when Reno failed the compatibility test, he felt relieved. He slapped himself to regain his composure and thought that he wouldn't get anywhere with that mindset. So he steeled himself again and thought that he would catch up to Reno, telling him to just watch. After that, in another location, it was reported that districts M through R were under armed closure and that all civilians within the area had been evacuated. It was also reported that districts A through N were now closed off, and as of now, all the monsters there had been confined to their subjugation areas. Jugo praised the troop members there, and then asked Reno if he was ready for what they were about to do. It turns out that Reno was already wearing the full gear made from number 6, and there appeared to be no abnormalities in Reno's mentality while wearing it, with normal levels shown by number 6 cells. Reno took a deep breath and replied that he was ready to act. Iharu looked on and commented that that was what the suit from number six looked like. It hadn't been unleashed yet, but he could already feel the cold air that would turn him to ice just by approaching it. While standing by and observing, Jugo commented that he hadn't thought Reno could achieve battle-ready numbers within just a month. He even tried his old trick of showing the harshness of reality by giving an impossible task, but it still didn't work whereupon Toko commented that if they were a business, it could be considered an abuse of power what Jugo did. On a serious note, Toko said that data from the third unit shows that Reno has undergone abnormal growth since enlistment, and while his current number is lower than Kikaru's when looking at the overall released force, Reno surpasses her in terms of speed of improvement. Jugo then remarked if this was what they call a genius, and either way, what happens in practice doesn't always occur in real combat. He called Reno again and informed him that he would subjugate a base monster with a platoon. The monster was a mole, type 67, and after its first appearance in 67, it had reappeared there about every five years. Its resilience was 6.4, and he himself would subjugate it if he thought Reno couldn't handle it. After that, he started Reno off and told him to show him if he was truly compatible with number 6. Reno, Oharu, and other troop members there then jumped into action to start the Bungue Pass subjugation operation. Ahara was amazed at the speed Reno was showing, so he shouted that it wasn't the time for him to hold back. He immediately used his full release and quickly chased after Reno. As Reno was running, he recalled what Jugo had told him about the burden of imminent monster weapons being heavy enough to potentially shorten the user's life. Jugo had given him a 10-minute time limit for the trial period. Reno thought that the time given to him was short, but he was determined to show results. He then encountered an afterbeast and planned to dodge its tackle and shoot it from the side. However, his movements suddenly froze in place, leading those in the control room to comment that Reno still didn't have control over the frost power of his suit. This almost caused him to be hit by the Kaija's attack. When the monster was about to follow up, fortunately, Iharu caught up with him and shot the monster's side. 
Reno turned to him, thinking that it was fine and that he could handle the fight. He remembered the times he had said he would protect Reno and pushed himself to fight as well. Unaware of a kaiju behind him, Reno managed to shoot it, causing a large crater in its body. Ihara was shocked by what he saw and couldn't believe the power Reno was displaying. Reno jumped to the side of a tree like a ninja, planning to ambush another after beast. He calmed himself and recalled what he had practiced. Reno used the frost power of his suit again, and the scientists in the control room were amazed that he was using it to stabilize his footing. After preparing, Reno pulled the trigger of his gun, and the shot solidly hit the back of the monster, exposing its core. Soon, the core of the kaiju cracked, causing its body to shatter. Ihara was shocked and seemed stunned, so a troop member quickly shouted at him to focus as there was a kaiju approaching from behind. Although he turned around too late to notice it, fortunately, Reno quickly came to his side and thanked him. Reno said that thanks to him, he was able to calm down. Reno shot the monster, and it seemed that each bullet he fired from his gun included frost power. The entire body of the monster that charged at them froze, and Reno told Iharu that he would take care of the rest, while Iharu worriedly thought about not being left behind and urged Reno to let him catch up to his strength. In the next scene, we go back to a point in time when Aharu was still in high school. It was shown that he was always first in everything there, leading other students to comment that there was no point in competing with him as they were sure he would still be a top ranker even in subjugation university. Aharu thought at that time that he was truly unrivaled. He absorbed everything taught to them, and the more he trained, the stronger his body became. He saw no limit to his potential then, and was excited to see how much stronger he could get. He believed back then that he could reach the level of Mina, Narumi, and Isao, and he had no doubt that he would achieve that. Returning to the present where they are still fighting mole-type kaiju, he curses to himself because he can't even knock down a single weak after beast with one attack. He shouts in frustration and fires again, but after the smoke clears, his attack still doesn't affect the kaiju leading to a powerful blow that throws him back. Other troop members are concerned, and Jugo comments that it looks like they need to send help, where Toko says she is ready to rush in to assist. Jugo tells Aharu not to push himself too hard, and that sometimes it's better to retreat. In his mind, Aharu calls himself pathetic, and thinks that everything has gone downhill for him since joining the defense force. He stopped improving and stopped being the best. He has seen actual prodigies with his own eyes, and every day he is hit by the painful reality that he is not one of them. He can push himself harder and harder, but he can never close the gap. Instead, it continues to widen. And there, the true monster appeared out of nowhere, referring to Reno as the monster. We return to the present where Reno is easily matching the base monster they are fighting, and the scientist in the control room is preparing to release his full power. Electricity flowed through Reno's suit, and gradually, electric shock effects emerged as he activated his full release, reaching a released force of 43%. After landing, he was quickly attacked by the base monster. When the monster thought it had crushed him, it turned out that he had managed to dodge the sudden attack. Suddenly, Reno just touched the arms of the kaiju, which immediately caused the areas he touched to freeze. After that, Reno climbed up the arm of the base monster and, as he moved, he shot it, causing ice spikes to emerge from the parts he hit. Soon, the entire left arm of the kaiju was frozen, and the scientist supporting him in his suit was amazed. Reno realized then that his attack wasn't working, and the epidermal hardness and regeneration speed of that monster were beyond those of the after beasts he had fought. He understood that he couldn't reach its core that way. Frustrated, he stated that he needed more power. The scientists were shocked by the sudden increase in his release force to 46%, which also caught the attention of Jugo and Toko. A scientist wondered aloud if Reno was getting stronger mid-battle. Jugo thought about it, and said that the scientist was wrong and something different was happening. Reno moved to a higher position and prepared to shoot again. When he fired, his attack solidly hit the kaiju creating a crater in its body along with ice spikes. Iharu couldn't believe what he was seeing, 
while Reno was still not satisfied, stating that the power was still not enough and he needed more. His release force increased again, reaching 51%, prompting his suit assistant to ask if he was okay, to which he agreed, saying that he actually felt more clear-headed than usual. The scientist grew concerned, and Jugo commented that something bad was happening, while Aharu also wondered what was happening to Reno. Reno immediately ran quickly while continuously shooting the kaiju, and they noticed that the monster was transforming, with Jugo commenting that it was getting serious. As he ran, Reno thought that if he were stronger, Kafka and Aharu wouldn't have been hurt in their battles. Despite the severe strain on his body and the creaking of his feet, he continued to push himself because he needed to do it. The kaiju prepared an energy strike and soon launched it at Reno. Reno clenched his calves to jump and dodge, but it was causing his muscles to tear. He managed to evade the monster's powerful attack, and Toko was amazed at his speed. Reno climbed onto the monster and unleashed point-blank attacks on its back. Ice shards erupted from the monster's back as he did this, and someone instructed him to destroy the monster's uni engine. While watching, Toko thought Reno was strong, but it was obvious that he was pushing his body to its limits. The scientists were very worried because Reno's blood pressure was rising, and they could see that his muscles were torn in six parts of his body, and they were sure his body wouldn't last at that rate. A scientist then wondered if he was losing to the influence of monster number six, to which Jugo replied no and explained that it was really just him, the real Reno. The scientist was puzzled, so Jugo further explained that people using numbers weapons are influenced by the mega monster when they sync with its cells and immense energy, leading them to experience an abnormal upsurge in brain activity and neurotransmitter amount and transmission speed. As a result, their true humanity and desires are pushed to the forefront, and depending on their personality, it could lead to them destroying themselves. The scientist couldn't believe it because it had never happened even once during training. Jugo commented that this was why the nature of battle is terrifying. The extreme mental and physical stress it places on a person can bring unforeseen circumstances. He added that the numbers weapon Reno is currently using, made from the core of the strongest monster in history, number 6, places a burden on the user far above the rest. We then see Reno's mental state, as he struggles with what Jugo told him about maintaining control over himself. Otherwise, he wouldn't be allowed to use the weapon. Due to the weight of what he was feeling and the constant pushing of himself that he needed to do, he couldn't explain what was happening to him. He said that his whole body was in extreme pain and it wouldn't stop, and he was crying because even his own thoughts were beyond his control. It seemed he was slowly being consumed by the power given by the suit made from monster number six, and he kept thinking that he needed even more power. Back on the battlefield, Reno suddenly unleashed numerous ice shards around him, and even the kaiju was easily hit by them. Soon, Reno created a freeze zone with a nearly 50-meter radius, and the scientists noticed it was attacking all living things within its reach, preventing other troop members from providing backup. Jugo noticed that Reno was rejecting any outside support, which meant that Reno was taking on such a massive responsibility. Reno again rained down numerous attacks on the kaiju using the freeze powers of his suit, managing to freeze 35% of the monster's body, and he was outpacing its regeneration rate, but his muscles continued to tear in 16 different parts of his body, and he also had four bone fractures. Even though Reno's physical condition was critical, and it seemed he could no longer continue fighting in such a manner, Jugo just observed his subordinate. When Reno landed on the ground, he suddenly lost balance, and it turned out that the bone in his left foot had broken, and a scientist reported that he was at his limit. Jugo closed his eyes and soon called out to Reno, telling him that it was enough and to stop. He informed him that he would move to subjugate the monster they were fighting and ordered Toko to help Reno. In his mind, Reno said he didn't want that to happen and asked Jugo to wait, fearing he would fail again. He repeatedly thought to himself how weak he was because he couldn't save Kafka, he couldn't save anyone. Suddenly, the horror rushed in and ran towards him despite the area being filled with ice shards, surprising Jugo. Iharu asked their commander to give them and Reno a little more time. 
Jugo immediately ordered him to leave the area because it was dangerous, but Aharu continued to push through and dodge the emerging shards. Jugo was shocked and asked what Ahara's released force was, to which Toko replied that it was recorded at 24, so he couldn't believe it was that low. Watching Aharu maneuver himself through the dangerous path to Reno, Jugo was impressed and almost felt jealous because Iharu was an honest, hardworking, and compassionate person. Iharu reached close to Reno, but was blocked by large ice shards. However, he didn't let that stop him and tried to break them with his hands while saying he believed in Reno and knew Reno could make a difference in that situation. As he tried to break the ice in front of him, Ihara shouted that Reno could do it. Ihara managed to shatter the ice shard blocking him and reached his friend, asking if he was right that Reno could handle it. Ihara knew that Reno could overcome the challenge. Reno felt a light of hope when he saw Ihara believing in him. And when he came back to his senses, he found that Ihara was already carrying him while running. Before Reno could speak, Ihara welcomed him back to reality and told him to just listen. Ihara explained that Jugo was buying them time, and some senior members were currently distracting the base monster. Reno was surprised, and Ihara suddenly said that wasn't Reno supposed to defeat that kaiju to start officially using the number 6 suit. Ihara would take him to a spot where he could attack the monster's core. Just as Reno was about to say that doing so would put Ihara in danger, Ihara stopped running and gave Reno a headbutt to snap him out of it. Reno ended up lying down, and Ihara told him not to underestimate himself. He added that Reno always does things alone, but Ihara was older, so Reno should just be quiet and trust him. Reno teared up and laughed. Reno pointed out how amazing a person Ahara was, and thought that in times when he was scared, Ihara was always there to guide him back on the right path. He wiped his tears and proudly agreed to let Iharu take charge. After placing Reno in the position Ahara mentioned, he reminded Reno to watch for his signal. Soon, they began the subjugation operation, over time. Iharu charged back into the battle, and the control room informed Jugo that Reno's mental waves had stabilized. Jugo noted that Reno seemed back to normal, but added that his body was worn out, so he couldn't fight like that anymore. They needed to either expose the core without Reno, or find a way to break down the monster's defenses to achieve a similar state. However, he thought it wouldn't be possible for Iharu with just 24% released force. Iharu was positioned on one side, and after charging his attack, he launched it at the monster, hitting its left leg. Due to the strength of the impact, Jugo thought that such performance shouldn't be normal for someone with 24%, and he asked his assistants to check what Ahara's released force was now. When they looked, they were amazed to see that Ahara had suddenly reached 41% released force. However, it dropped to 22% when he was thrown by the monster, which puzzled Jugo even more. Once Ahara was back in position, he seemed to get serious and managed to dodge the monster's next attack, and his released force then increased to 42%, leaving Jugo speechless and wondering why his released force was so unstable. Toko commented that she thinks Ihara's battle capabilities increase the moment he is in the zone. Jugo found this surprising and noted that their characteristics were closer to each other than he had thought. The instantaneous readings were comparable to Reno's, so if they could teach him how to use his power, Iharu would truly become a monster. Iharu charged again, thinking that he is not like Mina, Reno, and the others. He is not a prodigy, and being a hero was not really in his cards. He knew that the same path he was on now would lead him to the same wall he had reached before. But even so, he would keep punching and striving to break through that wall until he shattered it. So he told Reno and the others to continue growing and to let him catch up. He rained bullets on the monster and leaped high to target its back. The scientist in the control room noticed that Ahara's body was overheating and at its limit. Soon, Ihara managed to land a solid blast on the frozen area of the monster's back, exposing its core. While in free fall, he signaled to Reno to finish off the giant monster, and from the side of a mountain, he was shown ready to shoot, releasing a powerful concentrated frost shot at the monster. It hit the monster's core and penetrated further into its body, 
causing a large ice shard in the body of the monster. This was when they were dubbed the one-two punch capable of breaking down the toughest walls. Jugo was shocked by the teamwork displayed by Aharu and Reno, which triggered a flashback where he was loudly called by Hikari, even though they were in a library. He asked what was going on because Hikari was very excited, so she explained that her cells showed an aptitude for monster number four. Jugo was surprised, and Hikari further explained that her compatibility test was the next day, and if it went well, she would be able to take down even stronger monsters than the ones they currently faced, and she could minimize the damage in their jurisdiction more effectively. Jugo commented that it seemed like a good thing, then Hikari suddenly asked what Jugo thought would happen, which confused him. Hikari was asking if Jugo thought she would pass the compatibility test. At that time, Jugo hadn't thought about what would happen in the future, so he regretted agreeing with Hikari that she could control the number 4 weapon. Watching Reno, Jugo just thought that if he hadn't agreed with Hikari, maybe she would still be here, alive, vibrant, and happy. Soon, the target Kaija's vitals disappeared, so the scientist informed them that Reno had defeated the base monster. Joy was visible in Reno's eyes, and suddenly someone ran up to him quickly while shouting, and it turned out to be Aharu, who was also very happy that they had defeated the kaiju, and he gave Reno a high five. The two of them smiled at each other, and even the other troop members shouted in joy when they completed their mission. Jugo then commented that it must be nice, while thinking that he hadn't managed to stop Hikari from going or even fight alongside him when it really mattered. While thinking that the new generation now has the power to remake the future, he suddenly called Toko and cried, saying it must be nice to be young, which made Toko feel weirded out. He then commented, asking if Toko was distancing herself from him, to which Toko replied that anyone would be confused by a boss who suddenly starts crying. After that, Jugo regained his composure and called Reno to tell him that he had passed. He stated that Reno had proven himself, so he was entrusting him with a part of the country's future. Reno and Aharu exchanged looks, and Aharp smiled proudly at Reno, causing Reno to cry and thank him. Toko asked Jugo if that was all he was going to say to Reno, pointing out that Reno's sense of responsibility often led him to rush into dangerous situations, and asked if he wasn't going to address that behavior. Jugo replied that Reno would be fine because he had already learned from Aharu. He added that Reno didn't need to hear any lessons from an old man like himself. In the next scene, at the Tachikawa base under construction in Tokyo, Mina answered a call that turned out to be from Jugo, and she praised him for the good work he had done. Mina asked how Reno and the test went, so Jugo explained that Reno was pig-headed, stubborn, and constantly treads on thin ice, but trusted by his comrades, and a brave young man fit to wear number six. Mina slightly smiled and said she didn't want Reno to die, and that Jugo was the most careful when it came to handling the numbers, which is why she chose to listen to his thoughts on the matter. Jugo then commented that Mina was really running an old man like him ragged. He suddenly opened a drawer in his desk and thought it was an incredible opportunity to have encountered a young man compatible with number six, and another who had traits similar to his, simultaneously. He called Mina and said he would teach those two everything he knew, and turn them into soldiers that would amaze her. While looking at a photo from his past with his old friends, he also thought that as the last living among his peers, it was indeed his destiny to do such a thing. In the next scene, news quickly spread among the young members about Reno and his officially undergoing training as the first compatible user of the number 6 weapon. When Kikaru and Kafka heard that Reno would use that numbers weapon to fight number 9, Kafka suddenly shouted that Reno shouldn't do that. Just as Kafka was about to say that it was too dangerous, Kikaru smacked him on the head and reminded him not to insult his caution since they too were soldiers. Kafka looked stunned and realized this. After that, Kikaru said that now was not the time for worries, and they should focus on their next course of action. In Kikaru's mind, she thought that if Reno was to become stronger, she just needed to keep trying to surpass him. In the following scene, as night fell, Kafka continued jogging while reflecting on what Kikaru had told him earlier. He agreed that Reno was indeed impressive. He continually gains recognition through his own efforts. 
Kafka stopped and pondered whether he could say the same about himself. He questioned if he had ever pursued anything through his efforts, or if he had protected anyone with his own power. He realized that it wasn't him that the defense force needed, but Kaiju number 8. Suddenly, someone commented from the side that he didn't look very chipper, which surprised him. It turned out to be Hashina, who added whether Kafka was sure he could secure a spot next to Mina by being sad and acting like a sad boy. Kafka just stared, not knowing what to say, then Hashina suddenly charged at him and held a katana to his neck, causing Kafka to fall over. While Kafka was sitting on the ground, Hashina said he felt lighter now that he had avenged Kafka's sins. Kafka was puzzled about what he meant, so Hashina pointed out that he was referring to Kafka hiding his identity from him, and the scare with the practice katana was payback. Kafka suddenly cried, and just as he was about to apologize, Hashina put him in a headlock and pointed out that he had just said they were even now and he didn't want any dreary crap. After that, Hashina said he wanted to thank Kafka for saving the third division and clarified that the gratitude was not for Kaiju number 8, but for the person who transformed despite the risks involved. It was for Kafka himself. Hashina revealed that the investigators had given him a rundown of Kafka's physical condition and asked if it was true that if Kafka continued to transform, there was a chance he might not be able to revert to being human. Kafka was shocked, and Hashina said that if that was the case, he himself would defeat Kaiju number 9, and Kafka would no longer need to transform. He told Kafka he could now do things at his own pace and walk his own path as Kafka Hibino. That was what Hashina wanted to tell him. Kafka cried at this and realized he had almost forgotten that Hashina, who acts strictly, was his kindest comrade. Kafka thanked his senior for his words, but said he could not follow that advice. The truth is, he wanted to be recognized through his own efforts. He wanted to be recognized by Reno, Mina, and Hashina, but his own strength was not enough for that. It was so frustrating because his strength was not enough to protect anyone. He did not want to see tears on the faces of his teammates, which is why he would transform into number 8 and fight. Hashina's eyes widened when he saw Kafka's determination, and soon he just sighed, thinking he should have expected this to happen as Kafka is the type who would transform in situations like that. No matter what ruin lay before him, Kafka wouldn't hesitate to transform to save others when the time came. Hashina commented that if that was the case, there was only one way for Kafka to move forward. Thinking that they can't stop such things to happen, then he would just help Kafka enhance his abilities. He pointed at Kafka and told him to follow him, saying he would teach him how to fight. In the next scene, Kafka and Hashina went to a temple adorned with eerie statues. Kafka, puzzled about their location, asked where they were. Hashina explained that they were at Reunii Shrine, where, since the Edo period, the spirits of those who died subjugating monsters have been enshrined, including his own ancestors. Kafka was surprised by this revelation. Hashina mentioned that he thought Kafka knew about the mega monsters from the Myriki era. Kafka agreed, explaining that in 1657, nearly all of Edo and the Kanto region were consumed by fire. A disaster so great it was included in their school textbooks. Hashina noted that back then, the methods of taking down monsters were more primitive compared to what they use now, and the epic battle took place right where they were standing the site where the largest number of monster subjugators in history had fallen. Naturally, he added, when they die, they would join those ranks. It seemed to sober Kafka up, Hashina noted, as Kafka swallowed hard. Afterward, Hashina took off his jacket and challenged Kafka to show what he could do. Kafka was taken aback by Hashina's sudden challenge, prompting Hashina to remind him that he had promised to teach Kafka how to fight. With no suit and no transformation, Kafka was to show how much he had grown in a contest of pure physical strength. Kafka steeled himself for the challenge, accepting it without holding back, to which Hashina replied that he expected nothing less. As they prepared to spar, and when they faced each other, Hashina dared Kafka to come at him. Kafka threw a fast punch, but Hashina easily dodged it. Kafka then followed up with a combo of a right hook and a left jab, which Hashina also easily dodged. 
making Kafka realize the playfulness of their activity for the vice commander. Frustrated, Kafka thought he had no chance to win, but then Hashina countered with a solid right hook that struck Kafka's chin, causing him to feel dizzy. As he was about to fall, Kafka steadied himself, determined not to be knocked down so easily. Since leaving the third unit, he reflected, he had gained much more experience. Charging again, he resolved not to give up until he had demonstrated to Hashina all he had learned. The results of his training and the experience he had gained from fighting were all going to be shown to Hashina. He tried repeatedly to attack Hashina, but each attempt was easily dodged and countered. After being hit again by Hashina's fist, Kafka's positivity suddenly shifted, and he thought that none of this was helping him, and he really was worthless without transforming. Hashina then commented that he noticed Kafka had gotten stronger, which restored Kafka's self-confidence, and he attacked again. As their sparring continued, Hashina explained that by observing Kafka's body and how it moved, he could tell that Kafka hadn't stopped training even for a single day. He had been working hard even at Ariaki. However, Hashina noted that still wasn't enough, and he delivered a powerful left punch to Kafka's stomach, sending him flying. When Hashina was about to follow up with an uppercut, Kafka saw it coming and tried to block it with his raw strength. Just as Hashina's attack was about to land, he simply tapped Kafka and commented that Kafka was just repeating the same moves as before. Hashina explained that Kafka had a bad habit of relying too much on the strength and high rate of regeneration of number 8. If Kafka continued to fight recklessly, it wouldn't be long before he'd join the other troop members in that place. As Hashina prepared to launch another attack, Kafka noticed it was familiar, and when it solidly hit his body, he realized Hashina was using one of Isao's moves. Kafka was knocked down, and Hashina explained that the technique he used was called troop-style hand-to-hand -hand combat, a combat technique based on continuous monster subjugation fighting methods perfected by Isao. Kafka stared in amazement, and Hashina added that he couldn't bring out the full battle potential of a suit, so there was no point in teaching him how to use a weapon. Instead, he would drill Kafka in that combat style. If transforming was unavoidable, they needed to strengthen him to minimize his time as monster number 8. Living in that country meant dealing with monsters and the havoc they wreak. They won't stop emerging from number 9, so Kafka should fight for his future beyond that, hold on to everything he has to survive, and try to secure his spot beside Mina. Hashina pointed out that only Kafka's power would pave the way for him to advance. Kafka clenched his fists and was touched by Hashina's words, thanking him. Hashina smiled at him, but soon became irritated with Kafka's agreement, seeming overly confident that he would indeed secure his spot, declaring that he would never let Kafka have it to which Kafka retorted about what he had been saying earlier. After that, Hashina suggested they head back to the base before the lights went out there, and Kafka thought that he needed to strengthen himself. He realized he had been too caught up in being needed as monster number 8, losing focus on what was important. Kafka steeled his resolve, thinking he needed to level up himself further. Before leaving the shrine, Kafka showed respect by bowing there, but as he lifted his head, he suddenly noticed a figure in samurai armor staring into his eyes. He wondered what he had seen, and his focus was disrupted by that figure when Hashina called him. As he followed Hashina, he touched his head, pondering what he had really seen earlier. In the next scene, we see Kafka diligently practicing, seemingly doing lunges. He remarks that the exercise is harder than he expected. Hashina had taught him that the basics of troop-style hand-to-hand -hand combat start from the lower body, channeling the power generated by your lower body to your fists. The first step, he explained, is to rigorously train your body in five basic steps. Hashina would check on him two days a week during his visits to Ariaki to make sure Kafka wasn't just idling around. Eventually, while training his lower body, Kafka got a leg cramp and rolled around on the floor in pain. Suddenly, someone noticed him training. It turned out to be Kikaru, who trash-talked him by saying that troop-style hand-to-hand combat was perfect for someone who couldn't handle weapons. Kafka was annoyed and asserted that what he was doing was challenging, 
challenging Kikaru to try it. Kikaru responded that she knew it was difficult because his father used to train the same way every day. Kafka was surprised by this and remembered that Isao also practiced it, realizing he needed to work even harder to get stronger. Kikaru then pondered, noticing that Kafka seemed to have lost his earlier hang-ups. She praised Kafka, mentioning that if that was the case, it was good, and she had a reward for him. She pulled out a smartphone, saying Eiji had sent it for Kafka. Kafka was surprised because it was the phone that had been confiscated from him, and he wondered if they had decided to return it to him. Kikaru then asked if he didn't have an important call to make, prompting him to wonder. Kikaru pointed out that it had been a long time since he had spoken to the others. In the next scene, Kafka went to his room and stared at the phone, pondering what to say to his friends if he called them. The last time they saw each other was when he was captured, and that was almost two months ago. He grew more nervous as he thought about what they might think of him now that they knew he was monster number eight. Eventually, he decided to turn on the phone, and upon doing so, he received a notification. He was suddenly overwhelmed with notifications, surprising him, and wondered why they wouldn't stop. After a barrage of notification sounds, he saw that he had 503 unread messages from the Japan Anti-Kaiju Defense Forces. He contemplated whether to open them because he had kept his monstrous identity a secret from them. He feared the messages might contain accusations like calling him a liar, scary, telling him to stay away, and other hurtful things. Frightened to open them, he hesitated. Suddenly, the phone rang making him jump in surprise, and it turned out to be Reno calling him. He stared at it and decided to hang up the call, but once he calmed down, he screamed because he panicked and ended Reno's call without thinking, making the situation even more awkward. He just sighed and thought that he couldn't handle it and decided to talk to them next time. He received another call, and this time it was a horror of calling. He hesitated for a moment, but eventually picked up the phone and answered the call. When he greeted Ahark nervously, it turned out to be Reno, who was annoyed because when Aharu called him, Kafka answered. But when he himself called, Kafka did not answer. Kafka was speechless and tried to explain, but Reno brushed it off, saying they had other things to discuss. Reno shouted at Kafka, asking what he was thinking and why they hadn't heard from him for almost two months, and he didn't care if the defense force took his phone because he could have found a way to communicate. Kafka reasoned that he didn't have permission to contact anyone, leading Reno to ask if he had even tried to do that. Reno guessed that Kikaru had arranged for him to get permission. Soon, Reno calmed down and asked Kafka if he knew how worried they had been about him, which made Kafka's eyes widen. Kafka apologized and when he tried to justify why he hadn't called them, he suddenly realized it was wrong and that he was just making excuses for himself. He admitted to Reno that he was afraid he could no longer continue as a member of the third unit. He thought they would all be scared of him once they knew he was monster number eight. Ihara then commented that of course they would be scared, which surprised Kafka. He explained that such power only belonged to a monster, so he wouldn't lie and admit that it was indeed terrifying. Kafka closed his eyes and said he knew it. Iharif quickly added that being scared of something and disliking it were different things. He had seen Kafka, and the way Kafka had put himself in danger to save the base. After that, he pointed out how people could still think of him as an enemy after seeing him make such a sacrifice. Kafka then remembered Mina telling him that no one in the third unit thought of him as an enemy. Ihara got annoyed with him and said that when Kafka thought that way, it made him angry because Kafka assumed they were so cold-blooded. Reno then took the phone from Aharu and told Kafka to trust them. Not just him and Aharu, but all of them. He explained that he had already told Kafka that he believed Kafka would return, and pointed out that he wasn't the only one who held that belief. Kafka stared at his phone, and then we transitioned to another scene where Kikaru called Kafka for their joint afternoon training session, asking if he had talked to their friends yet. Kikaru noticed Kafka just sitting on his bed, so she asked him how long he was going to sulk. Kafka told her that Aharu and Reno had called him dumb, and he agreed with them. When Kafka turned to Kikaru, she was shocked by what she saw. It turned out that contrary to all he had thought, 
his friends had only spoken positively about him. This caused him to break down in ugly crying because he was touched by their words, and he called himself an idiot. Kikaru was weirded out by his reaction, but quickly replaced it with a soft smile, asking Kafka to tell her something she didn't know yet. After that, Kikaru became irritated and urged Kafka to start training, where Kafka commented that she also seemed to think he was an idiot, to which Kikaru simply urged him to get moving again. In the next scene, we move to Kaiju number 9. Here, we see Isao slowly sinking into the body of it. As he is being consumed by Kaiju number 9's control, he reflects that he is at his limit. It appears he tried to fight from within since he was absorbed by 9, but it seems that's as far as he could go. We are shown a close-up of Kaiju number 9, now that it has absorbed Isao along with his number's weapon made from Kaiju number 2. Isao thinks to himself that he has no more time and that they have grown far beyond what he could have imagined. We then go to Numata City in the mountains of Gumma Prefecture, where a terrified hunter thrown aback while his dog was barking. The hunter is petrified because he has spotted a giant white monster, which he reports to the officials. Elsewhere, in Aga City, Saitama Prefecture, a train on the Shonan Shinjuku line from Shinjuku at 3.20 p.m. suddenly stops, causing chaos among the passengers inside. While the conductor, terrified, sees a mysterious monolith floating on the tracks, eerily smiling as it does so, and he also reports this to the officials. In Shibuya Ward in Tokyo, a humanoid monster suddenly appears in the middle of the road near the Hachiko exit. It observes the surroundings for about three minutes and then disappears. In Chigasaki City, Kanagawa Prefecture, while walking on a beachside, two surfers encounter flying fish that strike them. Puzzled, they soon see a monster sucking the fish from the water and after eating, it dives back into the sea and disappears. On the Tohoku Expressway in Tachijai Prefecture near the Kamakawachi service area, people see a monster running fast, seemingly racing the cars, and after running 12 kilometers, it just vanishes. Moving to Sotagora City in Chiba Prefecture, several incidents of storage tank depletion are reported. The emptied tanks show holes on the sides measuring 15 centimeters. In Hokuto City in Yamanashi Prefecture, hikers discover mysterious giant craters that seem to result from powerful impacts, and it is currently unknown whether these were caused by meteorites or a monster. After that, we go to the Ariaki Coastal Base, where the higher-ups are meeting about the increasing monster incidents in Japan. Najizaka expresses frustration, noting the unprecedented nature of it, with 14 unresolved monster incidents just in that month alone. One of the higher-ups mentioned that the only commonality is that these creatures vanish before the defense force can arrive at the scene, clearly indicating they are smarter than typical monsters. Hashina commented that this might be a sign of an impending disaster involving Number 9. This worried the other higher-ups, prompting questions about the severity of the impending event. A higher-up with glasses noted that if this were the case, the rate of monster generation is accelerating faster than they had anticipated. Keiji stated that they need to quickly develop countermeasures, asking Hashina for a progress update. Hashina explained that they are currently beginning preparations for the operation of decentralized reserve power plants for the capital function, facilitating urban fortification and evacuation, and constructing additional underground shelters. They are also considering requesting international cooperation, but due to multiple issues with the subjugation treaty and difficulties in coordinating with other governments, coupled with concerns about potential leaks of monster materials, he believes it will be challenging to secure support from other countries in a short period. AG then stood up and presented a slide showing that as a subjugation measure, they are in the process of unsealing the suit made from Number 1 and are optimizing its synchronization with Narumi. Regarding Numbers 3, 5, and 7, they have two more compatible individuals currently under consideration whether to concentrate these in the Kanto region or disperse them nationwide. KG added that essentially, they are deploying the full power of the defense force to combat these monsters. But he noted that if another monster of the same class that defeated Isao emerges, it would not be sufficient. He then spoke to Isao in his mind, remarking how it is a bittersweet moment to be old and unable to do anything but sit back as an unprecedented national crisis approaches. 
We return to Yi Sao, who says that his consciousness is fading. He apologizes and says that all he can do now is leave matters to his subordinates. He silently wishes Narumi, Mina, their young warriors, and Kafka to save the future of their country. Soon after, Isao closes his eyes, ultimately succumbing to the grip of Kaiju No. 9. In the next scene, at the Ariaki coastal base, on basement level 13, Kikaru and Narumi arrive. Narumi comments that now he's taking Kikaru seriously, she should take what she referred to and make it her own, as it has been adjusted to her size and personal traits. It turns out he is referring to the number's weapon number 4, the instrument of war used by Kikaru's mother, Hikari, to slay many monsters. Kikaru stares at the suit and approaches it. While touching the incubator, she thinks about avenging her father with her own hands. Kikaru also speaks to her mother, asking her to lend her her strength.